Welcome to Igora vs. Headlines. I am your host, Cezary Jurevich. On this program, we tackle the underlying problems and the stories reported by the news media with the best solutions that we have to offer. And by we, we also mean you, our viewers, because by using the Igora networking platform, we all get to participate in the political decision-making process. Today on our panel, we have with us Lois Jurevich, our reporter. Alexander Vincent Pronger. I'm an engineer, a creator, a philosopher, and an outdoorsman. My goals are to destroy the oligarchy. Hi, I'm Daniel Emerson Tweed, a past local candidate here in Thousand Oaks and the CEO of Permatrail, a California nonprofit. Hi, my name is Rich Procida. I'm an author, attorney, and activist, and the host of the Truth in Democracy po podcast. I'm working to build a pro democracy movement in America. Hi, my name is Marcin. I'm a programmer and an entrepreneur. I uh, recently just started a nonprofit called Ascend Dynamic that focuses on startup incubation. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Before we hear today's report, a quick market update. Currently, the number one idea in the world is an idea for the universal basic income. The number one idea in the United States is an idea for eliminating the Electoral College. And since our last show, the idea that has made the most gains is... Oh wait, there isn't any. This is our first show. I guess we'll see what effect our discussion has had next time. Without further delay, Lois, what do you have for us? The Federal Trade Commission is considering a ban on non-compete clauses nationwide. A non-compete clause in an employment contract prevents an employee from working for a competitor or starting a competing business. It is sometimes valid only for a certain geographic area or number of years. At other times, it is valid even in the case of termination or layoffs. Historically, the main rationale behind the non-compete clause was to protect an employer's investments in their hires so they would not risk the loss of training costs, clients, or trade secrets if the employee were to suddenly decide to work somewhere else. But an increasing amount of low-wage employees have had to sign contracts with non-compete clauses like janitors, landscapers, and fast food workers, effectively preventing turnover and inhibiting raises caused by competing offers. Advocates of banning non-compete clauses point to expected increases in wages, job mobility, innovation, and competition among the workforce. The FTC expects workers' earnings to collectively rise between 250 to 296 billion dollars per year should this rule be enacted. But CEO stands to benefit the most. Their earnings are expected to rise at a rate four times that of workers paid hourly, according to the FTC. In addition to this, many lawsuits are expected to occur if the FTC does enact a national ban against non-compete clauses in employment contracts. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce has called the FTC's proposed ban blatantly unlawful. One commissioner, Christine S. Wilson, has pointed out in her dissenting statement that FTC leadership testimony before Congress has consistently said that the FTC lacks rulemaking authority to regulate competition. It is argued that regulating non-compete clauses is a matter for Congress or the states, California, North Dakota, Oklahoma, as well as the District of Columbia have already outlawed non-compete clauses for almost all employees. Several other states ban non-compete clauses by wage level or field of work. The FTC admits that there is evidence of increased training and investment in employees bound by a non-compete clause in their contract. In the current form of the FTC's proposed rule, non-compete clauses in existing contracts would need to be rescinded. One exemption from this ban would be non-compete clauses for sellers of a business. The FTC is seeking public comment on their proposed ban of non-compete clauses at the website regulations.gov through the 20th of March, 2023. Cesare, back to you. Thank you for that report. Now let's see what the panel thinks. 
Alex, it looks like you want to speak first. Tell us what you think. What do you got? So when it comes to non-compete clauses, I've had a lot of issues with those in the past. I've worked for a lot of companies that have, um, pardon my French, but basically taken me from behind and then just let me go with no regard for my welfare. They didn't let me work for other companies that were in the similar business. And now I can't work for other dealerships. It's kind of insane what they do to almost minimum wage workers. Daniel, what do you think? Yeah, this is a really uh, important topic, uh, especially timely because of the upcoming comment period, which Lois told us is running out, uh, I believe, in March uh, 20th, I believe. So I look at this through several lenses. There's the lens of corporate personhood, which uh, was really turned on its ear in a ruling around the turn of the century with um, Southern Pacific Railroad, which established corporations as kind of immortal persons uh, having... And then Citizens United decision gave them the rights of free speech, as much money they want to spend. Okay, so that's one one aspect. The other aspect is um, human trafficking. This is really a, um, a kind of human trafficking issue because uh, unnatural persons are attempting to traffic natural persons by restricting their natural, what I call humane rights, uh, an upgrade from human rights that uh, Permatrail is working to establish. So. I would say it's a pastiche right now. Let's make this an issue, not just a, a federal ban in the United States, but let's get the World Trade Organization on this and just ban these things unilaterally around the world as a restraint of uh, humane rights. Well, within my profession, it doesn't seem like they're used um, too restrictively. Uh, I can't seem to uh, go over to uh, client I've worked with uh, typically, but I can go over to various other clients uh, or at least various other companies that don't work within the same space. Uh, so um, uh, within the programming space, there's a lot of flexibility. But at the same time, I have heard of individuals uh, getting fired, uh, their department being uh, 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 what's the word for it, um, dissolved, uh, and them starting off their own company, trying to pull in the, the same clients that the, the previous company no longer supports, but because of a non-compete clause, uh, them getting sued and getting their life savings, um, uh, their home, uh, everything that they own uh, taken away from the company. Um, so there, there is a huge problem with non-competes. My fundamental approach to this is freedom and empowerment. That's uh, Freedom is one of the main values that I support in my personal values list uh, community in Igora. Um, I think we actually need to have maximum freedom, minimal government regulation of what people do, of how people engage with one another. Um, but then, Obviously, that's going to have sometimes disadvantages, consequences for those people, uh, for certain people. Uh, and the way we deal with that is not by restricting that whatever dealings that people make, but by empowering people to actually weather the consequences of their decisions and the activities of the market. So let people do whatever they want, enter whatever deals they want, and compete as fiercely as they want in the market. But then the people who who get hurt by it or who, let's say, get the short end of the stick, this is why we need something like the universal basic income to lift people up to make sure that they don't suffer as, as a result. So it's like, you know, fire and water. You know, you want fire to, to generate all that energy, but then you want water to make sure nobody gets too thirsty. So kind of combining the two extremes. I don't quite think about this topic very often, but it it is uh, very prominent within my profession, and um, and it does make sense for consulting companies that uh, that to have non competes. Uh, so uh, programmers don't go over to the company that they're uh, developing their application on. 
because then this other company would know that this programmer working on their application is a great programmer. And yes, we want to grab him. And yes, we're willing to pay more for him uh, because we've seen his work. It does make sense for a consulting company to put in a non-compete to keep that programmer from jumping over to the client that, uh, that they're working with. However, at the same time, with that being said, uh, that does stifle their salary because uh, it, if that non-compete wasn't there, uh, that programmer would most likely be offered more money to work for that client, seeing as that client really has respect for that programmer's work, uh, meaning that the consulting company would need to pay the programmer more uh, in order to keep him at that consulting firm instead of uh, jumping over to the client they're working with. Uh, so both of those facts are true. It, it sounds like, I mean, th this is clear proof that this is a necessary mechanism. Like, the companies don't invent this. They, they don't implement these, these types of measures uh, just because they can. They do it because it's actually necessary for keeping trade secrets. So I, I think it would be uh, very disadvantageous to actually deprive companies of I, being able to do that. I'd like but, to object on the on that because um, programming isn't a trade secret. Like there's tons of programmers that can program uh, and the company doesn't invest any money uh, on uh, improving uh, or teaching programmers to program. They already go through college for that. They may give them some training sessions, some training courses um, uh, that may be expensive at some times, uh, but, uh, but there's no trade secrets that are being passed around there. It's just the ability to code cleanly and effectively uh, that makes the developer desirable um, for a client to take that developer on. And honestly, it does stifle the developer's salary because now the companies can't compete against each other for that developer. And it stifles the companies that, that would compete for that developer because now they can't uh, get the best developer on their team. Um, so I would say that, uh, compete clauses aren't, aren't a good use for that case. Rich, as an employment attorney, I really want to hear from you. Well, I couldn't disagree with you more, Cesare. We need regulations on our employers. Otherwise they abuse power for someone who's against the oligarchy. You know, you want to get, you end up giving the oligarchs and the employers absolute power. Now there are reasons to have a non-complete cause i mean if someone is going to try and steal a company's customers and then start their own business but to restrict employees from being able to get work in their field is oppressive to the employee if an employee is a janitor or if the employee is some type of worker and they're not allowed to go work in their field that's what they're trained for they need access to those jobs and there's no reason for the employer to re restrict or control what that employee does after he leaves the company as long as he doesn't steal the company's business or their trade secrets or their list or or their customers um th that's one thing but so there needs to be some regulation in our employment i mean there's tons of regulations there's been we've had a history of abuse by employers we've had to fight and people have died to get rights and to get an eight even in just an eight hour work day or to end child labor you know these are the types of regulations that need to go into place otherwise people will abuse their power and that's why um i think the ftc is probably on the right track in banning at least most non-compete clauses if they're used in an abusive manner to um 
oppress employees and to keep them servile. Okay, so I'm familiar with the labor history in the United States. Uh, you know, the only time that the United States Army dropped bombs on U.S. soil was, well, actually, maybe also during World War II. I, I don't think airplanes were involved. But sometime between the two wars, World War I, uh, there was a, a big movement of workers. You know, I think they were trying to move on some town or some factory. And the U.S. Army was called in to actually drop bombs from the primitive bomb, uh, you know, the, the biplanes. Uh, to, to drop on the U.S. population. So uh, I know the struggle that, that has happened here, but what I'm saying is that there is a better way to handle this situation. Um, I think fierce competition is really great. It's, it really spurs innovation and it, it makes people try harder. But at the same time, we do have to take, we do have to understand that people are not just machines people i do think people are machines but we also have feelings we're we're machines with feelings and we have to acknowledge that some people don't want to starve to death some people want to be able to take care of their families and loved ones uh, this is why i do think uh, i support the idea for maximum freedom uh, in the marketplace but at the same time i also think we should empower the people so if they are in a in a in a relationship with an employer that they find oppressive, they can just leave and they can be fine. And they can be like, you know what? It was, you know, it was fun working for you until it wasn't goodbye. I'm going to, you know, enjoy myself until I find something better. So as long as you empower the people to end those abusive relationships, well, you end up having a lot less abusive relationships because they're not as competitive. So the employers that actually provide a better workplace, are the ones that are going to succeed in the market. Uh, I think, Alex, you had something, please. Yeah, it was just in regards to what you were talking about with uh, bombs being dropped on U.S. soil. I think it's important not to forget what the CIA has done and what's currently happening in Ohio. I mean, there, for, there was a chemical derailment of just bad shit, and they got acid rain out of that. And then a day later, a metal many metal manufacturing plant exploded and before that 9 11 i truly do not believe that that was terrorists i'm pretty sure that was homeland shit and then okay. there is also jfk there's a lot of bad shit that they do and that's all homebrewed a famous supreme court justice uh, john marshall said the power to tax is the power to destroy uh, I think logical tax policy should, should tax bads, not goods. People competing and working and being productive is a good. And the non-compete uh, clause is effectively a tax on productivity. Uh, also, you can't sign your rights away in advance. You know, if companies feel like their trade secrets are being violated, they have every right to sue that individual. But to, to blatantly put this, this blanket uh, tamp down on on uh, productive competition of free humans and employees is just really onerous. And I think this, this really, uh, these non-competes do need to be shot down in a nationwide kind of federal ban. So uh, I'm strongly supporting uh, the, the upcoming proposed ban on non-competes. Well, the important thing about competition is uh, the freedom to enter into a monopoly is is part of freedom. The freedom to eliminate your options is also a freedom, um, because that's how. Well, that's how businesses are formed. You, you, you work for one company, um, and that's the company that you want to grow because that's, that's where your, money comes from. So you actually, so you that dedication. The dedicate. There are different ways of developing mechanisms of de dedication. And if this is one of them, and if it works for some companies, then I think they should be able to complete, uh, compete in that way. Um, but I, there is a point that I wanted to make. It, this is really from a personal perspective. Um, as a truck driver, so and, and I did just get laid off like two days ago. So this doesn't so much apply right at this moment. It, actually, in fact, if I had a contract, including a non-compete clause, I would be very happy that I did if I had that because maybe it would protect me further. Um, but so 
work with the previous company for which I was working. Uh, I was working, driving a smaller size truck, and I was interested in driving a bigger size truck. Um, but at the same time, I wasn't really willing to pay out of pocket to invest myself into training for a bigger vehicle. But if my company had offered me the deal, um, we're going to pay for your training, we're going to send you to school, you're going to get a license to drive a bigger vehicle, but we don't want you working for any other business for one year, assuming that I'm on contract, that you know they offer me the job, I would be happy, I would be delighted to take that. And so now for somebody to come along and to deprive me of that opportunity and to instead force me to spend my own money, which I may or may not have, in order to be able to increase my income, well, that's just outrageous. I'm sorry, but you're trying to screw me. This is not, now it's getting personal. Now, I did, like, like I said, I did just get laid off, so that's not that much of an issue. Uh, but I think the point is, is that if non-competes are used intelligently, they can be tremendously beneficial. And I would have been very glad to be, be the beneficiary of a non-compete agreement if I got improved training um, with, with a reasonable contract. You're focused on saying that because businesses have an interest in making money that they will do the right thing is misplaced. When we have, we have discrimination laws and I've done discrimination laws, will the companies, will people do the right thing and, and hire the best employee regardless of their race? Not necessarily. Yeah, you know, it's it. People, we have these laws in place because it didn't happen, because abuses occurred. When we give people absolute power to control, when they have the power, you know, these contracts are something called contracts of adhesion. In other words, you have no say. You either sign or you don't sign. And I look at those types of contracts with a lot of skepticism. Because how many, how much can we read a long boilerplate contract and then be held to this, in this case, a non-compete clause that prevents us from getting a job in the future? Or, you know, there's too many abuses. That's why we need regulations. That's why the FTC is banning because it's been abused. And I would rather see a democratic workplace than this libertarian, um, absolute freedom type of invisible hand faith in the invisible hand is going to solve all our problems it's not we need regulations we need to regulate the workplace or else we'll find our employees abused we'll find ourselves um being taken advantage of and um that's why we have labor laws that's why we have labor protections that's why we have that is because we want to protect people's rights and we want people to be able to earn a living and contribute their economy and not be oppressed. Otherwise, we won't have any choice. And if your voice is choice, if your concern is freedom and choice, imposing these terms on employees who are need jobs and need to be paid is to take advantage of them and to abuse them. So that's why we have protections to protect our employees, you know, and wiping those protections away is not going to solve anything. It's not going to make a better economy and employers are not necessarily going to do what's right for their business. And if we allow everybody to do that, then certainly we people will be oppressed if we didn't have the anti-discrimination laws, anti-sexual harassment laws. I mean, before that, look at the Me Too movement. Before anti-sexual harassment laws, you know, what type of harassment was going on in the workplace? What could you get away with? What did You got to remember, people can abuse their power. And that's the big problem we're facing here in the world is the abuse of power and human nature's tendency to abuse their power and to take advantage of other people. And that's why we have to have laws to make sure that everyone is treated fairly and that we have a functioning economy, not a wild west type of take advantage of claw tooth and and nail and fighting you know just to survive and having to give up all our rights to get another job in our same field just to get a paycheck that we need to feed our families rich uh, 
I, I think you're missing the point here. Uh, we have these laws because we don't have better laws in place. Uh, my point, the main point I'm trying to make here is that uh, I understand what these things are, what problems these laws are trying to fix. I'm just saying that there are better solutions. You know, a better solution is to make it optional for people to accept that job because ensure that people are going to be doing okay whether or not basically give them a better negotiating position say like make empower people to be able to say no i don't like this contract i want a better one let's negotiate a different contract instead of a non-compete clause see like most people don't even think it's like it's not even in their realm of possibilities to say that, like, I don't like this two-year contract, I want a one-year contract. Do you want my services or not? Because you're only going to get them if you shorten the term of the contract. I'm fine with that. Make it one year instead of two years. Make it six months instead of 12 months. But the way that people become able to negotiate is because by actually having the power to do that. So what, what I'm saying is the better solution is to let the let the businesses negotiate what they want, but empower the people to negotiate what they want. So they can make that employer optional. You know what, maybe if somebody is not finding the job that they want, maybe they can just say, you know what, I'm gonna look for a job in six months. You know, I'm gonna take a break for the next six months. I'm gonna take my family to on a trip to, you know, to Europe or to Asia or something. Let's, let's spend a little bit more time enjoying, enjoying the world. You, we basically need more wealth distribution. The better way to deal with this is greater wealth distribution so that people are in a better negotiating position when looking for a job and accepting contracts. I noticed that uh, trade secrets have been brought up uh, a few times during this chat, uh, probably, um, you know, without realizing it, but, um, but yeah, we should probably take account that like trade secrets already have their own laws. Like uh, they shouldn't be considered in a non-compete um, discussion. You know, thanks for clarifying that. I think it was actually me who brought that confusion into the thing. I wasn't completely clear with what I was saying. So thank you for clarifying that. It's not so much the trade secrets, it's really the commitment of someone and the protecting the investment that an employer makes. Yeah, a couple of great points I'd want to jump in on on this. Uh, I love Richard's point about contracts of adhesion. And, you know, a great example of this is the uh, EULA or the end user license agreement. I mean, you, you have to check the box as it is, or you don't get to use the software. It's it's a take it or leave it kind of deal. You don't get to have line item veto power on, any, on a EULA uh, for some software. I, I know, Cesare, it sounds great if we could, you know, negotiate all the, oh, I don't like this one year. Can we change that to six months? No, that's not going to happen, you know, and in this extreme, you know, anarcho-capitalist vision of the free market, they tend to say, well, you got productive people over here and the rest of the people are parasites over here. And if you give the parasites too much power, they're just going to like swamp the productive people. This is like the whole Ayn Rand vision of society, you know, and, and it's a, it's a very, abstract you know kind of almost neo-utopian vision that's not the way the real world works you know I, and when you're weighing things like a non-compete law you know which is what we're trying to zero in on here you have to look at the harms and the benefits you're weighing harms and benefits okay a benefit employees might train their workers more that's a good thing right but you know the harm is some uh, employers might take advantage oh free training i'm just going to get trained up here and make them spend all this money and then i'm going to you know offer myself back to get the best deal from someone else because now i'm all trained for free haha -ha. you know so there there are legitimate you know interests in both sides and bo of both parties that have to be weighed and um i just tend to think that um the scale is tipped <laughs> heavily in favor of corporations and businesses against the the haves against the have-nots you know that's why capitalism needs rules you know the Nordic model of capitalism is great because it, it kind of balances the harms and the benefits of the haves and the have nots. So that's what we're trying to achieve here in, uh, in the United States, I believe. Uh, Richard, um, yeah, I really loved your comments. Uh, they were great. Um, uh, we 
I, I feel like all the laws that we have are baseline laws. Uh, we can do something more so like what Cesare suggests is having uh, uh, laws that allow us to better negotiate or situations that allow us to better negotiate. But as Daniel stated, most likely you'll be called a socialist and a communist uh, and ostracized for your beliefs um, because most of the time those situations consist of uh, limiting uh, the uh, work age from uh, I don't know what it is 18 to 70 something uh, when you retire uh, or offering uh, people optional positions possibly from the government to if they don't want to work for a private institution that they would work for a public institution. Um, and with that being said, uh, back to Richard's point of if companies can abuse the system, they will abuse the system. Uh, recently, there was a report out that uh, uh, what, what was the meat packing company um, had their name, but it skips my mind. Uh, they've been hiring uh, 16 to 13 year olds to clean their factories. Uh, and yeah, so if they if if they can get away with child labor, they will allow for child labor. Speaking of child labor, uh, we have basically all the children in the United States uh, are working for free um, in schools because uh, they're forced to go to school. They don't have an option out of it. This is our society forcing them to become uh, instruments of our investment so that they can pay for our retirements. So, it, you know, if you want to talk about child labor, first of all, we already condone it completely. We just have it in the form of schooling, you know, primary, secondary education um, for what, 10 years of a, of a person's life. And we don't pay them for it. You know, if you wanna, so, so child labor is fine. Uh, we, we've already accepted, all of us have already accepted that child labor is fine. The problem is that we're not paying these children for it. I think we actually should be paying children. We, we should be compensating them uh much more for uh, for the work that they're doing because it's not really beneficial to them it it might be later but maybe they don't get to see those benefits uh, for whatever reasons when it comes to what rich was saying i i agree with him wholeheartedly the one of the biggest problems that we have is the lack of freedom when it comes to corporations like they love to control us they like to put us down and put us in our place and i just i can't abide by that the oligarchy is my enemy and toppling it you have to start somewhere and by recognizing the problem that is a starting point again the, very simply that you know i've been making this point from the beginning i think it's better to maximize our freedom. And so I, I do support the idea uh, for how to create the most fair market. Um, you can, uh, well, it's it's basically minimizing the role of government, but at the same time, I support the uh, idea for the universal basic income. I, I do think w that will enable people to enter into the business relationships that they want when they want to. That's the big thing is make it optional for people to work, withdraw the supply of labor and force the employers to offer better compensation to the people. This whole problem goes away when you implement the universal basic income. I mean, to me, that's obvious. Like we wouldn't be having this conversation if not for that. And then just the, the last th thing I just wanna say, underscore from my personal point of view, if we have non-compete agreements, you know, that would be depriving me. It's It would be depriving me of an opportunity. Uh, I might still actually end up doing that. Uh, I might actually become a, a bus driver. I might apply for, for a job locally here to be a bus driver. They actually pay for your training. I have a feeling that they're going to be uh, offering me a contract with a 
you know, requirement that I stay with them, maybe that I don't work for them. It's fine. I don't want to work that many jobs. So I'll, I'll be happy to just work for that one company. If it's a reasonable amount of time, like a year or, or two, usually it's not even that much for, for those kinds of jobs. It's usually closer to about uh, maybe six months, six months to a year. I'll be happy to get that training. I'll be happy to get that investment from the employer uh, for guaranteeing that I'm not going to work for anyone else. I think the only time that it does really become problematic is if you restrict someone from working for another business after, you know, if you're not making money from that business anymore, but you're still bound by, by an agreement by them, that's really sucks. But again, if I had the UBI, wouldn't be a problem. Uh, so I want to give Rich, uh, since he is our uh, attorney uh, here specializing in employment law, I, I do want you to have the last word, Rich, please. Well, one of the things I wanted to say, you know, that children have the right to an education. That's, and it's the education is a service provided by our government. And even though children may not want to go to school every day, but their parents want them to go to school. And that's why we have child labor laws so that our children can go to school where they should be. You know, and, and of course we ask our children to do chores and to do work, but that's not employment. And while universal basic income may be a solution, it's probably not going to address the abuses of employers or the power dynamic as much as you think. And on the bottom line is we don't have universal income right now. And that's where these laws are coming into effect to protect employees. And so I believe we're going to need to restrict, if not eliminate, I'm not sure eliminate all non-compete clauses, but certainly restrict them to the appropriate parameters for what their intentions are and for the social good and for the protection of our workers' rights. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Uh, thank you to all of our panelists and thank you to all of our viewers. Remember, you have the power here to decide which of these ideas are the best. Or maybe you think you have a better solution. Please share it with the rest of us in Igora. Also, if you want to discuss ideas one-on-one, -on -one, we are building a culture of making ourselves available to one another through citizen office hours. See the meetings page in Igora for details. And finally, if you'd like to be a guest on the show, please see the video description.